professional services teams hated the product as much as our customers. That was embarrassing. Okay, not the, <laughs> you know, and this is uh, this is sometimes the reality of people who build products is that, you know, it just doesn't get to where you want it to be right away. So, a few years ago, Barry and I were uh, employee three and four or something like that for Acquia, and um, we had met at. Uh, online and through the Drupal community, but we met in Barcelona in 2007 when we were in stealth mode with Acquia. And uh, we were actively in the process of raising our Series A. And uh, we went ahead and we were uh, fortunate over the next several months as we did uh, some validation around the business that the Drupal market was going to be big enough to support a startup uh, servicing that community. And we were uh, fortunate enough to get a Series A round of $7 million. And, and so, you know, that presented a, a really wonderful opportunity for us to build products for our potential future customers. And I'd like for you all to take a moment and just think for a second, what would you do if somebody were to, particularly Dries, were to come to you and sit down with you and give you $7 million and say, let's go build some great stuff and get some customers? It's not an easy question to answer. It is, it is really, I remember that Kieran and I and Jay Batson were sitting in one room in an office in Andover looking at each other saying, who is going to pay us and for what? And we, you know, like we knew, okay, Drupal and services, but, but what exactly? We really had no idea. So, so I'm going to tell you the story of, of what we did. But before we got there, we didn't have, when we started Acquia, the insight of some of the great tools that are out there that are available for you today. In particular, a project that was released this last year called the Startup Genome that went out and interviewed in fairly in-depth process over 600 startups and to see what the code for cracking innovation and innovative new products was. And in that, in that paper, and you can go and you can register for it, the Startup Genome, and download it, and I encourage you to do so, they found that startups move through six phases. And if they move through those six phases in order, that they will be successful. And if they find that they skip those phases, they are unsuccessful. And that was the conclusion of the research. And what they said was that you first you go through discovery, then validation, then efficiency, then you scale, and then you hit profit. And then you hit renewal or decline. And basically, this is the core crux of the issue that we were at. We had the money, we had a baseline, but we somehow had to get to this ideal killer product, right? And how do you get there? Do you get there through brilliance? Do you get there because you're a genius? Do you get there because you have great architecture or great design? Do you get there by listening to your customers? How do you get there, right? And that's what I think what Startup Genome tries to talk about. There's also been a great book that every executive at Acquia has, and our leadership team is required to read called The Lean Startup. And this has become very popular, New Relic. A lot of companies are offering this book for free um, to read. But it's basically this idea of how can we develop um, products in a really efficient and effective manner quickly. And they start, and most of these are targeted towards uh, technology companies, but they start with technology commoditization, right? Something, a great tool like Drupal, which is a basically commoditized content management, has commoditized social features, has commoditized um, the distribution of content through channels. So that's one. And you all have access to Drupal, and you can all come up with product ideas and go build a great product with Drupal. But it's not enough to just have the technology. The next thing is you really need to come up with something called innovation accounting, which is really how do you measure the innovation that you, you're building? How do you go out and design something and create it and get some data about how it's doing and then get a feedback loop. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then that's not all. Not only do you have to have great engineering processes, but you've also got to do something called customer development. And you've got to go figure out how to listen to your customers. And the cool thing about the Lean Startup and the Startup Genome is they found that customer, the companies that could figure out how to listen to their customers correctly grew seven times faster. Okay? So getting, you know, growing really fast and maybe not needing that next round of funding Something that's you know incredibly a good opportunity, and then last but not least was um, another book in this in this series by a guy named Stephen Blank called The Four Steps to the Epiphany, and it was really about customer discovery, customer validation, customer creation, and then building the company. Okay, so as we're talking about these things, and you're thinking about your customers, and you're thinking about your products, note these down and come back and research them because you're going to find them to be really valuable for the product that you want to build. So for us, when we first started in this little office in Andover, we reached out to two members, prominent members of the Drupal community. 
Mike Myers, who had raised $14 million for, to build out his website, now public, and Ken Rickard, who had worked for a large uh, newspaper chain, two of the people who were building some of the largest Drupal properties out there. And we brought them and flew them up to Andover. And do you want to talk about what we asked them? I don't remember in exact detail, but you know, we were, we were forming the basis of, of the first thing we were going to offer, which was the support model, right? That Acquia would answer questions that you had about uh, with, with deploying Drupal for your enterprise. And uh, I remember we drew up, we wrote up on the board like 10 or 15 different things they might want from Acquia that they might want help with or services. And we told them, you know, you have, you have 10 points, go vote on the board however you want to distribute your points. And so we were just, we were trying to get from them, like what is it that you want? Um, what we came away from in those very early meetings, you know, this is like January, February, March 2008, was that the first major impediment for these companies, you know, these, these two companies, I mean, they had Mike Myers and they had Ken Rickard, right? But a lot of other companies that wanted to use Drupal didn't have these well-known members or the very experienced members. And so their concern was, I deploy this software and I have a problem with it. Where am I going to go? Am I going to post a message on the, you know, the, the D.O. forums and the mailing list and hope I get an answer? That wasn't enough for large companies. So, you know, hence we, ha we, we landed on this support model as the first thing to do. And so what we validated was, and the success of the meeting was, if we were to offer it, they would buy it or something like it. So we moved to the next second stage of the startup genome, which is learning. And as a startup, you might be thinking, what am I learning? Is my job to build a product? Is my job to make a profit? Is my job to hire employees? Is my job to get a great team? Is my job to disrupt the marketplace? And really, as a startup, and we maybe didn't know this at the time, but we really were answering two questions. Number one, can we build a sustainable business, a business that can self-fund itself, keep going on with customers and stay profitable and get the payroll paid. And then the second one is, should we build these products? Right? And really what we were doing is, as a startup, this was an exercise in learning. How fast could we learn? How quickly could we learn? How could we validate our assumptions as part of our learning? And that drives a lot of what we're doing and why you spend time with customers is to really learn. And so the biggest, you know, the biggest cost time advantage is that you know, don't build features that your customers don't want. Right? How many people have worked with an engineer who has a great idea for a feature? <laughs> okay, how many of you have failed to sell it? Okay, and more hands went up in the second question than the first question. Okay, and so it's really critical that you build something that your customers actually want to buy. So, so this is where we can describe the, the first major pivot that occurred to Acquia, the first bit of learning that you might say we had foisted upon us. So uh, go to the next slide. So we, start, we decided, OK, we're going to provide support, and we're going to do it through a portal called the Acquia Network. But we don't just want to be a support company. We also want to be a services company where we, we offer, you know, we build products which provide services to customers. So we built this thing called the Acquia Network. We hosted it in, in EC2, which becomes a much bigger part of our story later on. Um, but so through the Acquia network is how you access your support. So it was, you know, a website that you logged into that you could submit support tickets. And then we we're, we're thought, okay, we want to provide some services. What kind of services can we provide? And uh, what we came up first with was with, you know, customers want to know that their websites are up. So we built the first service of the Acquia network, which was the Heartbeat service. Did anyone in here, was anyone here a customer of Acquia in, before like 2011? Did you ever use the Heartbeat service? I see a hand going up. Was that useful to you at all? Kind of. Kind of? Thank you. Very kind. Um, so what we, <laughs> we, learned, we learned two really critical things. One is we put a fair bit of time into building that service, um, but we didn't really validate very carefully whether that was exactly what customers wanted for a thing that measured the uptime of their site. In fact, the way it worked was only when your site ran cron did we find out whether, you know, did we ping you and check whether you were online? And then if your site didn't run cron, like you chose to turn it off for some reason, we would start sending you alerts that you were offline. You're like, no, I'm not offline. I just stopped running. You're like it, it, it didn't make a lot of sense. We didn't really do a great job of validating it. The other more important thing was that we spent, you know, when we, when we brought Ken and, uh, Ken and Mike, uh, Michael Myers up to Acquia and asked them about support, we were asking them, you know, are you interested in if we, you know, if we support Drupal and a certain core set of modules. And they said yes, answering the question, we would like support for Drupal. And there was this really subtle disconnect that was happening that 
They thought we were offering to support anything in Drupal, and we thought we were offering to support a limited subset of like core plus the top 100 modules or something. And so we launched the Acquia network in September of 2009, uh, eight, sorry, September 2008, and um, nothing happened. What we discovered, the learning we had foisted upon us was customers weren't interested in a subset, uh, support for a subset of Drupal because 100% of them had a custom module, a custom theme, something that wasn't in our, our list, something from the long tail. And so the box that we had drawn over the support we were offering did not fit any of them. And uh, you know the sales bell didn't ring for a couple months, at which point we engaged on our first major pivot. <laughs> And so in, if you're not familiar with a pivot, a pivot is when you basically do a course correction um, and you reevaluate whether you should continue to develop the product in the direction or do you change, right? And so there are a lot of good examples of companies changing direction. Um, and I think the key point here is that that first phase where people who use Drupal really think about it, it's like, if I take Drupal and cloud, amazing. I've combined two technologies that are really cool. Now I have a product that's successful, right? You know, Drupal plus Node.js, awesome. Drupal plus Mongo, awesome. Uh, Drupal plus Redis, awesome. You know, pick your technology and people will think that if they combine the two. Drupal plus Civi CRM, awesome. You know, and uh, people think it'll sell. And uh, we learned that it's more than just, to, you know, the introduction of technology. And so they had come up, come up with this concept called innovation accounting as opposed to having a long project roadmap with milestones and uh, total number of users and things like that. The idea is to really get a, a flywheel spinning of getting ideas and code and data and learning and building and measuring. And the, the po whole point here is that when you're in a startup or you're building something for customers, you really have no idea what you're doing. You think you know what you're doing, but you really have no idea what you're doing. And so you're trying to reduce uncertainty by spinning that wheel really fast and getting around that first loop of building something, getting it up to customers and testing. And so, um, and so there's an actual engineering process and some practices around agile development and minimum viable products. So what we, were, we were doing this, oh, I'm glad that was empty. We were, we were doing this back in the summer of 2008. We were using a, an agile software development process called Scrum. And so every three weeks we would have a cycle where we'd talk about the features we wanted to build and we'd build them in that three weeks and then we'd deliver it and we'd have an internal demo meeting and show all, everyone all the cool stuff we'd built. And um, we're still using that to, that to this day and it's actually a really great uh, development methodology. But I think looking at this, at this uh, slide here of the innovation accounting, what I'm basically trying to explain is that uh, we didn't get this right in 2008. So we did the build, and even though we were operating in a very fast, uh, agile process, we were, we were shipping internal releases. So we were shipping new releases internally every three weeks. We weren't shipping them to customers every three weeks. We didn't ship them to customers until September. Notice that we started in January. So we spent way, a way long time in that build loop and then we finally shipped it, and when we hit that measure loop, well, I told you what we measured. What we measured was zero. Very clear signal, easy to understand, and hence we had that learning box. So, uh, you know, this is the, this is the, uh, the, the just the, the history of how we went through, you know, learning this the hard way. Anyway. Great. In a startup, no facts exist inside the building, only opinions, right? And so when we first started, we, um, we had uh, started with our CEO, Jay Batson, and we had a chairman, a guy named Tom Erickson, who's now the CEO of Acquia. And Tom said he wanted to see what we were doing, and most of our business model was based on inside sales. We would do some marketing, people would come to our website, they'd see the phone number, they'd call, we'd answer the phone, and we'd sell them something, right? But then we decided, well, there's a lot of people using Drupal out there, why don't we get somebody out in the field? And so I had been running Drupal cons for a long time, or for a while, and knew a lot of people in the community, and so I decided to call my friends at Sony Music. And Tom said, you're gonna go see Sony Music? Sounds like fun, I'm coming. And so off we went to Sony Music in New York City, and I went inside and hung out with all my friends at Sony Music from Drupal Cons and staying up all night and drinking beers and chatting and stuff like that. And we got in there and I presented our support plan and they stood up and said, awesome, we want support, we use Drupal, we've got a couple hundred sites, we want that enterprise support, we'll buy it. And my CEO said, congratulations, you have a new job. You're now our field sales guy at Acquia. And I was like, what, what? I wanna go back and be a community manager. But the point was, was that we had an opinion inside, right, that we could sell support, but it wasn't until we got to Sony Music. And then at DrupalCon DC, I'd been calling the Obama campaign staff because they had launched 
the Office of Management and Budget through the White House had launched recovery.gov. And Barry and I were on the security team, and we were terrified that the highest profile Drupal site of recovery.gov in the world was going to get hacked. And when we pushed out a security release, we had to know that they were going to update that code. And so Barry was calling the White House phone switch line <laughs> and saying, um, please, could you get the Obama staff to go and update, update core? And, you know, or something to that extent. You I know, I mean, that. yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, we didn't know what we were doing, right? So we're at DrupalCon DC, and uh, I get a phone call. I'm like, hi, and it's like, hey, it's, uh, it's Dave Cole from the White House, and uh, really appreciate the contacting the Obama staff, uh, campaign staff, uh, letting us know that, uh, that uh, DrupalCon's going to be in town. We really appreciate that you've offered us tickets to come to DrupalCon and give us a tour, but we're not going to be able to make it. We're really busy. I'm like, totally understood. Like, however, would you be willing to come to the White House? I'm like, hmm, <laughs> hmm, yeah, I'm available. And so, um, so I went and I grabbed Dries, and some of you were there, you might have saw it on Twitter, it kind of got it on Twitter a little bit at, uh, at DC, and Dries and I, off we went to the White House. Now, for the last five years, I'd come from IBM and had been doing enterprise stuff and IBM research, so I saw Drupal as this thing that was going to mature so that big companies would use it. So we were really dedicated on security, we really thought hard about architecture, we took everything that we were doing. And when you look back where we were, it was ridiculous. But we just, we just took ourselves really seriously and worked really hard to make Drupal really credible. And so when we got to the White House, we laid out a roadmap of we th every question we thought they would ask us. And so we basically said, here's what you got to do for security, here's what you got to do for scalability, here's what you got to do for maintenance and management and hosting. And we just rolled it out for them and then told them how to work with an open source community, told them how they could come to DrupalCon, how they could hire developers, how they could build their team. And shortly after that, they agreed, and uh, I can't say a lot about what we do with the White House, but I can say that they did become uh, a, ver a very early customer of ours, and they did uh, manage to deploy on Drupal. And so, yeah, that's, uh, we, we transitioned from an opinion that we could do something to fact. And, and right around that same time is when we made uh, what I'll call pivot number zero for Acquia, which is we, we, particularly talking to these two customers and some others, when we finally figured out, oh, you know, this box that we've drawn around the support that we're gonna offer, it's not going to work, right? Customers were hearing something different. So we made our first pivot. We called the project Big Tent, where we said, okay, now instead of defining that we're going to support Acquia Drupal in the top 100 modules, we're going to support everything. Anything Drupal 6, anything Drupal 7, custom code, contrib, your theme, whatever. So, and that was a really major shift. We'd spent nine months with this model that we were, we were going to, it was like the equivalent of Red Hat Linux, where they ship a certain set of software and support it. We thought we'd do the same thing, except it didn't work. So enormous shift, the exo entire executive team was involved to decide, okay, we're going to really, you know, expand the definition. And, and then we started getting some yeses, like Karen was just explaining. Great. So we started signing up more and more customers, and we started supporting them. And pretty soon, we started getting phone calls. Hey, we're supporting us, but our servers are offline. Hey, Apache's down. Well, we're here to support Drupal. We're not here to support Apache. We're not here to support MySQL. I'm sorry that you only allocated 32 megs of RAM to your 200 module Drupal site, but MySQL is not gonna run. Please go get a system administrator who will tune your MySQL. And more and more of those customers basically either thought they could host it themselves and clearly couldn't, or were like, we don't wanna host it ourselves. And so we've discovered you know, pivot number two, or pivot number one. Pivot, yeah. But no reason about it. Pivot number one, if that was the other one was zero, was a lot of our customers really needed hosting or wanted it. And so we found ourselves having to go there. And so this is a really interesting thing because when you look at the Startup Genome Project, one of the things they say is there's a right amount of pivots that you should have in your company. If you have zero pivots, you probably weren't listening and you're going to fail. If you have four pivots, you've probably changed your company's business so many times, you're out of cash and you're going to fail. So the optimal number of pivots is to be around one to two major pivots in your startup early on. And so you should be anticipating that you are gonna fundamentally have to change the products that you're developing and as you're listening to your customers, you go there. So change significantly one to two times. And so the question is, should we build this product? And Mark Andreessen, for those of you, you know, might be not familiar with him, he's the, he was the original developer and founder of Netscape. He went on to uh, build a great company called Opsource which uh, had a massive series of layoffs in the middle of the first recession, and then like 
miraculously, 18 months later, he turned around and sold it to Hewlett Packard for hundreds of millions of dollars. I don't know what he did in those 18 months, but he certainly affirmed himself as a true visionary, and he's gone on to, you know, be founders and or be funders in Facebook and LinkedIn and a whole whole series of other ones. And so he says, in a great market, a market with lots of real potential customers, the market pulls the product out of the startup. And that's what happened to us. We were trying to support people, their servers were failing, and we just got sucked into that business. We just had no choice to go there. And so as you're working with your customers on your products, you're gonna find yourself getting sucked into businesses that you had no idea you were gonna get into, probably even thought you didn't wanna get into. So what are we trying to do from a customer validation? We're basically trying to you know, minimize the total risk of failure by checking our, your theories against reality. And so we got to this point where it was like, okay, we're forced into the hosting business. What are we gonna do? Is Jason from Red Hat here? No, okay, good. Um, and I can tell you the story. No, um, so Jason uh, was from Red Hat and, and Jason's job was to um, uh, basically print magazines, glossies, uh, brochures, gra you know, sort of a graphic design background. And they were looking for a CMS and said, we need to go get into this web space a little bit more. We wanna put up different kinds of websites. And I said, well, what's your team look like? And he says, we're effectively you know, content people and graphic designers. And uh, they basically had no tech skills. And so I said, well, let's give it a shot. Would you like us to host your website for you? And they said, oh boy, would we? That would be great. If you guys could just take care of that and make sure it all stays up, that's great. And uh, at the time, we were building our stack on Ubuntu. And we said, would it be all right if we uh, ran the Red Hat website on Ubuntu? No. <laughs> so <laughs> we went out and, you know, we had no choice, so we stood up a couple of Red Hat servers and Amazon Web Services, and we were in the hosting business. We were hosting part of Red Hat's sites. And then Barry started building a product, and he said, I'm building a product, and I'll, it'll be ready in six months or something like that. I think, I think six months is what he wanted. And I said, great, I'm gonna start selling it today. And, uh, and so I was in San Francisco, and I went and I found a great customer called Mother Jones that was having a big website. And I actually have been working with them to get a case study printed on the front page of Drupal.org talking about how great their website was, except they weren't really comfortable with me posting it on the front page of Drupal.org because it was kind of crashing a bunch. And they were like, we'd really like to get Drupal working first before we start bragging about how great it is. And I said, okay, well, how about we help you? And so they said, great, love to get some application support from you, love it if you could host it. You want to talk a little bit about what happened then? Sure. Well, so the first thing I want to say is that if you read the, the Lean Startup book, they talk, they talk a lot about the minimum viable product and you know, what can you do that's the fastest thing that you can ship to get any data, any validation at all, right? anything from the measurement phase. Well, it really kind of annoyed me back in, uh, what was it, May or so of, of 2009 when I'm, we're trying to build this, this hosting product and Kieran went and sold Red Hat on custom configured servers. But you, then, then we read this Lean Startup book a few months ago and they described, I don't remember what the example they gave in the book, but it was some company that was providing some kind of like shopping service. And their minimum viable product was that like you would submit on the web page the, the products that you wanted bought for you and it was like you'd type them into a text field and the CEO would print the list, drive to the store, buy the products and bring them to your house. Unbelievably inefficient. Right, but it, but it gave them the data that there were people who were willing to shop online, which they didn't know before they had done that validation. Well, as annoyed as I was when Kieran sold this thing to Red Hat, because it was completely not what we were building, it did give immediate validation that if we provided a hosting service, that there were customers for it. So, I apologize. It's okay. <laughs> um, then we brought, on, we brought on Mother Jones, and that f so Acquia at the time had different levels of support that we would sell. We had our enterprise level, which was the all you can eat, 24 by seven, no matter what happens, what you break, doesn't matter, you know, we'll wake everyone up to solve the problem. And then we had lower level tiers than that that were obviously a lot, a lot less expensive. Um, you know, we had a professional level tier that had like six tickets, you know, a limited number of Drupal support tickets you could submit. And so we thought, okay, well, we have this hosting platform. You know, we'd like to sell it to as many people as we can, so we'll sell it to anyone who has any of our subscriptions. You can have an enterprise with support, or you can have a professional with support, or maybe you can even just have the, I'm sorry, with hosting, not with support. You can have enterprise with hosting, professional with hosting, or maybe just hosting, just by itself, you know, and you don't call us for Drupal support. Maybe you have your own developer team, you don't need our tech support. And in fact, Mother Jones uh, was our first hosting customer, and they started with just hosting. And then a few weeks after they launched, their site crashed. Now, the product, our hosting product, was brand new. The support team didn't really know it that well. 
everyone, including us, including me, we all sort of figured, you know, it's probably our fault. I mean, certainly we had found lots of things where we'd put bugs in the system and it wasn't very reliable, but, but the site was down and so all hands on deck and um, we went and debugged and debugged and debugged and eventually we discovered that they had made a small change in Drupal core, which it turned out was a bit of a mistake and that was taking their site down. So what we learned from that, this was sort of the second major pivot, we had this hosting product, we were selling it um, we thought we could sell it just to any of our customers, but when we realized, okay, if we're selling guaranteed your site's gonna stay up and your site goes down, by the time we're done debugging the problem, maybe it's our infrastructure, maybe it's your code, maybe it's your custom module, we have provided enterprise support for that customer. We have you know, dug all the way through the details of their custom code. We realized we can't sell this without enterprise support because if we do, we're gonna provide it anyway and we can't afford that. So, Second major pivot, I mean, within two months of launching the product was we just stopped selling it for anyone who was not an enterprise customer. You could no longer buy the professional level of service with a limited number of tickets and be on our hosting platform. And this will play substantially into our conversation later. <laughs> okay. So again, we're, we're talking about the four, four steps of the epiphany. We're working through our phases of customer development and we're still on customer validation. And so our goal is to you know, find the minimum set of features that we could require to get the early customers, and that's what we just talked about. Um, the second thing is we want to test the business model risk, and certainly, you know, when you build a product and you launch it and you put service levels around it, some of your customers are profitable, some of your customers you break even in, and some of your customers you lose money on, right? But the idea is you don't want to lose money on all your customers. And with the scenarios that we were running to where we were putting 10 hours of debugging, 18 hours of debugging of top-tier top en engineers, we were losing money. No, not on everybody, but on some of these. And it was really clear that we were putting ourselves at a business model risk. And so as we tiptoed into this hosting business and had signed all these contracts to deliver hosting for a year, we started having some real tough questions internally. And you get to this point when you've got a product called Persevere or Pivot, right? And people in our company were like, we need out of this business. It is so scary to have everybody in the company freaking out at 3 a.m. in the morning trying to keep these sites up. It's so painful that we can't do all the other things that we want to be able to do. Maybe we should just get out of here, right? And so you have to make a decision, and this is the great failure of so many startups, is unbounded optimism, is that we'll just try a little bit harder. We'll just put a little bit more of the staff payroll on the credit card. We'll just stick it out for a couple more months and keep burning, and maybe we'll succeed. And can't do that. You'll die. You'll die. You'll just plummet right off the cliff into the ground. You've got to be prepared to pivot. And so that was a tough decision. And in this particular case, I believe passionately in this. I think Barry believed passionately in it. And at the end of the day, you know, we chose to persevere. But don't take that decision lightly. Okay. Yeah. Well, and you know, we persevered but with with the pivot of we're only selling this with enterprise support, right? Basically, we were like, we have to be paid in order to do all this manual work that we know we're going to do. We abandoned the the sell it to everyone part of the business at that point. So the next stage, the third stage of um, customer development is customer creation. And what we quickly discovered was that um, trying to guess how much hardware you need to run a Drupal site that's completely custom, that may have 200 contributed modules, that may have 100% authenticated traffic, may have 100% anonymous traffic, may have 30% authenticated traffic, had a huge impact on whether or not that site was going to stay up on that particular amount of hardware. And so we uh, added an engineer to our team, a guy named Chris Yates, to our pre-sales team, and he took over, and as part of that product, he had to go through and size every single site before it went live to make sure that there was enough hardware and the customer was willing to pay for, to keep that site up. And that was pretty tough. And so we see here we've got a, a baby customer getting sized for a suit to make sure it fits. Now, what we found early on was there were definitely companies that were very interested in our product. And on one end, there were startups. And the startups were new, they were trying to move fast, and they were like, if we can, you guys can take care of this, we'll go focus on all that other cool startup we're doing, just run our Drupal site for us. The problem we found was that startups were really conservative with their cash, and they really didn't want to pay for service levels. And they also kind of sometimes were a little bit sneaky about telling us how big their sites were. Because some of these were like social media companies, and so they'd be like, oh, yeah, um, during the Super Bowl, we're like the most linked to site on the internet. 
oh, thanks, thanks for letting us know 18 hours in advance that you're going to need 10 times the amount of hardware, right? And so, you know, they would, they would crash. Or, you know, when we said our site was Drupal, what we really meant was, like, it's mostly Moodle and, like, a million lines of custom PHP code, and uh, I think there's, like, some pages from it from Drupal. Oh, awesome. Thanks for telling us. Right? No wonder it's not running well. Right? And so these are the kinds of problems we started with startups. And then on the other hand, we, you know, we found you know, some, some good places where enterprises, they were like, you mean it costs less than a million dollars? Because that's what the IBM guys charge us. And we're like, uh, did we say 10,000 to host your site? We meant 100,000. <laughs> right? And they were like, this is awesome. We're going to move everything over. Right? And so sometimes in sizing, we also had a, a great thing, a great experience. I got a call from Disney. Disney was using Drupal in a big way. They were using it for ABC Family, they were using it for a bunch of their properties, they were using it for the TV show The View, and we were really thinking, awesome, Disney's gonna take off on Drupal. And we had a champion over at Disney, and there were a lot of digital agencies that were delivering Drupal sites for Disney, and they basically called us and said, we wanna see if you can size Disney for Drupal. And I was like, amazing, let's do it. So it was me, I get on a phone, and there's like 12 senior, 25 year, years of experience architects, and they're like, we do 30 billion pages a month. What can you do? I'm like, well, um, it's pretty scalable. Um, yeah, mm hmm um, And so we're like trying to come up with, you know, use cases. Like we did a 20 million page view a month site once, and you know, stuff like that, and they're like, does Drupal have a CDN built in? And I'm like, no, but there's a module. But it doesn't have CDN built in. No, but there's a module, but it's not built in. Okay, therefore it's not scalable. Uh, but that's not really, Thank you, it's not scalable. Oh, hmm. And so that's the way the conversation went, and I went to my CEO and I said, give me engineers, we're gonna build a billion page view a month infrastructure and prove to Disney that we can do this. And he said, no. And I got this really career level embarrassing email back from Disney about what a massive failure um, we had been in convincing them that we could help them deliver 30 billion page views a month. And that has hung over me like a cloud of shame for about two and a half years. And then in October, I got a phone call. Hi, it's Disney. We've been failing in our CMS deployments for the last two and a half years. We've made a corporate decision to move it all to Disney, uh, to Drupal. Woohoo! And so we're back in the game, right? And so Disney is now hiring, and if uh, you're, maybe some of you are in the audience, um, uh, some of the Disney folks are here in the audience, but uh, they're hiring a lot of Drupal developers, and they're gonna build a big platform and deploy a lot of Drupal sites. So trying to fit for customers and trying to create those customers and get that pipeline is a really important part of the experience. The fourth stage of the Marmor uh, startup scale is to focus on scaling. And really what you're do now doing is you're now at the fourth stage of customer development. You're in the company building stage. And really what your goal here is to validate your founders' beliefs. Jay and Dries believe that we could create a company that would help enterprises and large organizations succeed with Drupal no matter what. And so we just put our heads down and tried to figure out how to do that. And that meant tweaking the products and adjusting the products and making it work. It also meant we had to scale the business. Now, I was one guy and I went out and I met Sony and I went out and I sold the White House, but that wasn't gonna work. I mean, I can only sell so much. So then we started building teams. We started hiring more and more salespeople and we had to scale them up and then we had to do more and more marketing activities, and effectively what you want to do is you want to build a sales funnel, right? Now, how many people have been the lead technologist and had to go into the field and sell products? Okay. How many people have failed to convince their salespeople to sell as well as they do? Okay. You see the problem, right? So you've got to figure out a way to scale and get that funnel of sales coming down through the pipeline. Okay. Now, in that startup genome report, they came up with some analysis that talked about the theory of market types. That as a startup, there are a series. And the startup that we were was called the challenger market type. We're the short guy. Vignette's the big guy. We're trying to go up and take over the enterprise CMS market and we're gonna get our butt kicked. But that's the business model. It's an enterprise sales model, enterprise sales field force, and that's the way you go to market. And we did that and, and, and it worked pretty well for a while. But then we found ourselves in a situation like Wally, -E, where we were persevering and persevering and stacking that garbage higher and stacking that garbage and putting in nice little neat boxes for what felt like a thousand years. And then we kind of found out that we needed to get into another business. So Barry's going to talk a little bit about where, where we needed to target. So 
so when we last left our pivot story, it was, it was uh, October of 2009 and we decided we were going to sell hosting only with enterprise support subscriptions because after all, if we debug your site, we're providing that level of support. And that, that led us down some very dangerous roads. We made, at the same time, we had a lot of people in our company who were doing another project called Drupal Gardens, including most of our visual designers. And so whenever we came upon a question of, okay, we're adding this new feature, it's a really cool feature, what are we gonna do for the UI? How are our customers gonna use it? We said, well, we don't actually have design resources at the moment, and it doesn't really matter that much because every one of our customers has an enterprise support contract. They're allowed to submit an unlimited number of tickets, and so you know, we'll put in the best user interface that we, the engineers, and I suck at designing user interfaces, the best interface that we can figure out, and if anyone doesn't understand, they'll submit a support ticket, they'll, it'll be explained to them, and then they'll get it. Great. Big mistake. We were completely failing to pay attention to our customers. Two things happened. One, our support team hated the product because guess what? It was confusing for them too. And they were always having to come to us asking questions. It made them feel like it just wasn't a very good product. Our customers were, as we predicted, were having to submit support tickets in order to get basic thing done. Now, how many people in the room like submitting a support ticket in order to do something that's necessary for their job? Yeah, no hands. No one likes, likes asking for support. You want the product to work. You want it to be easy to use. So we, we led ourselves by making this necessary first pivot, led us to this very dangerous position where the user experience of our product just wasn't very good. And the other thing we realized around this time was, you know, we're selling to enterprises, but the people who are building the websites at these enterprises, they're not the CIO, they're not the VP of marketing, they're developers. And the developers who work at an enterprise are just like the developers that work anywhere else, right? They're programmers. They like a good developer experience just like anybody else. And we had simply completely failed to build the product for them. So this was now towards the end of 2010 and we made another major pivot. So we'd had this product, we were selling it only with enterprise subscriptions with, I don't remember what the prices were at the time, but five digit or higher prices which meant, first of all, none of the small developers could afford the product, which frankly was a good thing because they would have hated it, as you saw that slide at the very beginning of the presentation, where our own engineering and PS teams didn't like it because it was too hard to use. So we started in January when we finally got the religion, we got this message that the, the experience was no good. And we crushed ourselves for about two and a half months and completely redesigned the user experience, added a whole bunch of automation for things that previously our support team had done for the customers. Um, we, and then we launched the, the new version of the product called DevCloud a year ago, actually, in Chicago, at DrupalCon Chicago, um, which was a huge improvement, and we got a lot of positive feedback, and, and we lowered the price a lot, so now instead of a five-digit price, it was a three-digit price. And then over the summer, you know, we're selling the product and things are going pretty well, but we start getting more feedback. So we had started building this product in 2009 when SVN was a fairly common version control system that people were using, but in the meantime, the whole Drupal community had shifted to Git. And we thought, you know, Git, SVN, they're not really that different. People can use SVN. Eh. Didn't matter if we were right. The customers had decided and the customers were speaking and they kept telling us, why can't I use Git? I want to integrate with GitHub. I want to integrate with D.O. So after, you know, vainly trying to argue that we were making the right choice for a couple of months, we finally, like, you know, the, the, the product was pulled out of us. The customers forced us to add this, you know, this particular feature. There were a few other things that we did where when we started, you know, we were still, when we launched DevCloud, we were still kind of an enterprise company, so we thought, all right, we're just gonna sell for a, a one-year contract because with our enterprise customers, we'd always sold one-year contracts. Well, it turns out developers don't buy hosting in one-year increments. They buy it in monthly increments and they pay by credit card and we didn't have that capability. So over the summer of 2011, this was only last summer, right, we, we had, there were these major objections that we finally started implementing. And around the same time, we, we, got, we got design resources coming off of, uh, and, and usability resources coming off the Gardens Project, and we began very frequent usability tests where we would put the product in front of the customer, have them try it, have them tell us all the things that were broken, and then the usability people would come back to us with this nice report saying, you know, here's the top six critical issues and the top six, you know, major issues, and we started knocking those down one at a time so that 
by the end of the year, by the end of you know 2011 or so, we started seeing our usability numbers. Yeah, here's an example. You know, that our our usability people would hand back things to us with like little arrows saying, "This is terrible. No one understands." Blah, blah, blah. Um, and so by listening to customers and iterating and doing these usability tests every single time we released the product, we st the, the story really started changing. And it was interesting because you know we'd been we we'd had this experience that was not really that great for a long time, and everyone hated it. And we got into a position where we thought, you know, it doesn't, it might not even matter if we make, you know, make the experience better. Maybe people are just going to hate us no matter what. I don't know. We're the big guys. We're Aquia. But it turns out we listened to the customers. We started doing the things that we said. And the usability score started going up. And people started liking it more. So the, the rapid iteration of build a feature, measure the results with usability testing, feed that back in. We've learned something and iterate really started paying off. And so this brings us to the fifth stage of the Marmor stages of profit maximization. We've built the fundamental product. Now let's just crank the wheel and sell a lot more of it. And by making it easier to use, we lower our support costs. The product goes out, and profit maximization starts to happen. So we get to the last stage of uh, the, the six stages called renewal. And what we found was that um, some customers enjoyed their experience, but often they would use a ton of support when they first launched their site and went live and spend the entire budget that we may have had for that customer. And then as they got towards the end of the year, they would say, you know, things seem to be working. And whenever there's the problem, you guys kind of fix it. So I think we're done. I think we're ready to go on our own, right? And so they stopped subscribing. Now, not necessarily in huge numbers, but there were certainly some who were doing that. And so we said, you said, you know, we got that feedback earlier about how good our heartbeat module was, and it was kind of like, eh, it was all right, all right? But then we started saying, well, let's add a bunch more things. And so we started building out a knowledge base, because we had hired all these people to do support, and they had all these great things, so they had 500 articles that were in there. And then we started adding these tools, like um, Aqua Insight to help with configuration, and Mobify to do mobile, and the Lullab Lullabots Drupalize Me videos for training, and SEO grader and automated testing. And people started saying, you know what? These tools are really great. I want to keep running them on my website. You know, I'm going to renew because they're awesome. They're really helping a lot. And then last but not least was that classic support that we started off with in the first phase. And so our renewal rates went, our renewal rates went up and uh, investors gained more confidence and we were able to keep the business going and, and hire more people. And so that worked really well. So this brings us back to those, this learning phase and brings us towards um, you know, what we started off in the beginning, which is, can we build a sustainable business? Right? And so many startups start, and they build absolutely amazing products, and they take them to market, and they do a ton of marketing, and they get a, hire a bunch of expensive salespeople, and they rush out into the market, and it's very successful. And then they run out of cash. Because the cost to acquire customers for the marketing campaign and the salespeople and the initial product was so expensive that the lifetime value of that customer, whether that customer is going to be there for a year or two years or three years or five years, whatever it is, just doesn't balance out. And so startups run out of money even though they've got a killer product, even though they've got a killer team, even though they have a great market that they can be selling into. And so getting that right balance of the cost to acquire a customer and the lifetime value is something that you have to be thinking about as you get ready to listen to your customers and build products for them. What I want to leave you with and what I want you to think about is that as you take Drupal and you use it to help your customers to build products, to solve problems that they have, to build solutions for them, it's not just about Drupal in the cloud. It's not just about Drupal in some other technology stack. You've got to get an engineering process in place that's very fast, very iterative, and you really start listening to your customers. And you listen to them, and you measure that listening, and you get that feedback back. And at the same time, you're also thinking about, how am I building my customer base? How am I doing discovery? How am I doing validation? How am I creating my next generation of customers? And how am I building my company? Okay. Today, we're really happy to tell you we've got a lot of amazing and incredible customers. And uh, we really appreciate how much effort and time and patience they have given us, not only the funding that they've given us, but they've stuck it out with us and said, we like you guys, we really want to see you succeed. And they have taught us a ton. Um, despite ourselves, we finally started listening and 
I mean, I think we were trying to listen, but maybe not as listening as effectively as we should have been all along. And I hope you take away from this that you can create the processes that allow you to learn from your customers and, uh, and launch a million great products. It's been a really exciting time. I know Acquia kind of has an interesting position in the Drupal community with Dries being the founder, but I am really happy to tell you that this year we saw Commerce Guys raise $5 million. We saw Pantheon raise $5 million. We saw Datasphere raise $8 million. We've seen uh, Webform launched a couple of weeks ago. We're seeing more and more Drupal companies succeed. Get this idea, get that quick feedback. They're taking Drupal, they're building products around Drupal, and they're taking it out to the marketplace. They're proving that investors are seeing what they're doing, and they're saying, we love what you're doing. Your customers love what you're doing. We want you guys to do it forever. Here's a check. So there's promise. I hope when we come back next year, it won't be four customers, four companies that got funding. I hope it'll be 40. And I think that you know, if you read these books and you follow these processes, I think that can really happen. So thank you very much for your time. Be happy to take some questions for you. <laughs> you got a question if you could come up to the mic because it's being recorded. Is that yawning or, or quiet? Okay, great. <clears throat> so I, uh, when you were, you were explaining things, I was actually, it was, it was funny that uh, I was comparing this to like design. Uh, in the, our interface design process that we go through where uh, people don't know what the heck they want a lot of times and so you just throw something out there and then based on the feedback you start morphing it into something that they actually can use or they, that they actually wanted but they didn't realize what they wanted until you actually put something out there. But um, I did want to ask like with your pricing like when someone's like oh I want to do hosting or something like that what, what was your what was your experience with the pricing? Did you, did you end up always underselling or, or, and, or were you overpriced or, or how, how did that go and, and how did you learn how to key in on that? Um, it, you want to go? Okay. I, it's been a really interesting experience. The first time we tried to sell any hosting, I went to my head of professional services and I said, what's it going to cost to set up a website in the cloud? And he said, the setup fee will be $10,000. And I was like, oh. God, you've got to be kidding me. $10,000. I can go to GoDaddy for $7.99. Why $10,000? But, you know, then I started to really look at the market and see what people were doing to set up fairly sophisticated clusters of servers, get all the tooling around there, and I realized, oh, wait, what does a Drupal developer make these days? Does a Drupal developer make $35 an hour? Does a Drupal developer make $50 an hour? Does a Drupal developer make $125 an hour? Hey, there are Drupal developers making $300 an hour. Oh, yeah, I guess if it did take four days or it took three weeks to set it up, maybe that's not so bad. And then I'd go out to customers, and when I go out to customers today, and I say, hey, who's doing your hosting? And they're like, big systems integrator company. And I'm like, well, what are you spending? And they're like, for four boxes, we're spending about a million, and it takes three weeks for them to get back to us. And I'm like, you're comfortable with that? And they're like, well, they've got a couple of security enterprise features, and that's the only choice, and we're, you know, we save money because we buy an aggregate. And I'm like, really? So... Those are real experiences uh, between that. And I feel more comfortable today where, um, you know, $150 for, for three sites at DevCloud, and then we go up to, you know, customers where it's multi-million dollars to host all their stuff. But it's been painful. Uh, answering that a slightly different way, figuring out the pricing it, it is really, it's, it's a, you know, a, a build, measure, learn loop all of its own. Um, you know, when we started, and figuring out the pricing model, too. So when we started with hosting, something I didn't talk about was, you know, when we first brought on our first customers, we were on a shared, we were, the, 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 the idea was to build a mesh, a grid, right, where we would have all of our customers on one system, and they could buy slices, and so you could buy one slice, or you could buy 20 slices based on how big your site was. And we were pricing it on that, and so, as Kieran said, you know, a Drupal site, you can have a million page views and it can take almost no hardware because it's all anonymous static cached, or you can have 100,000 page views and you can require a ton of hardware because your views queries are really complicated and whatever. So we tried to figure out, you know, how do we, how do we sell this to customers? And we decided to price it in terms of page views because customers understood page views. And clearly more page views is more value. So we just said, okay, a slice, I think it was like a slice was half a million page views or something like that. And then a slice at a price and you could buy however many slices you wanted. And um, that just turned out to utterly not work because, because 
you know, the page views didn't really correspond to what your requirements were, and the customers didn't really understand it, and then we had the support thing. So, you know, we iterated on the pricing model lots of times. Um, in fact, right now, we're in the middle of a, a major iteration on pricing with DevCloud. When you buy a DevCloud subscription, you, have, you can have three sites on that account, or 10 sites on that account, and if, then you can buy another subscription for three more or for 10 more at different levels. And we've been doing that for a year, and uh, starting around last fall, we were getting very clear messages from, from the customers who actually loved us the most. And they said, this is terrific, but like, how come I have to break it up into sections of 10? What that means is when I need 11, I'm kind of losing money for a few months until I need 16, and then, I, you know, and then I'm breaking even again, and then the last four, I'm, I'm profitable, and then I need to buy another 10. Like, what's this about? So we're shifting over the pricing model again to be per site. Um, which is just, you know, our customers beating us on the head saying, this is not how we want to buy the product. We want to buy it this other way. It's our money. Yeah. <laughs> so we do what they tell us. Um, if you found this, you know, our talk about not listening to your customers and user experience, uh, Lisa and Darmesh are, are two people who are very active in the user experience around Drupal itself. And so they do a lot of usability studies on Drupal, and they also do some stuff on our products. They're doing about 100 different usability studies here this week. So if you're interested in participating, or you want to see what that li is like because you've got a product and you want to see what it's like to go through that study, I encourage you to go ahead and sign up for that. I also had a colleague of mine who wanted to plug and say that we're uh, doing another session. I'm doing another session immediately after this one called 200. Um, migrating and scaling 200 artists in the cloud, and so um, it's, in a, it's in a different room, but if you're interested in seeing that, it's a, a really great rock and roll story about migrating clouds, and then we've got also got another one about a uh, panel that's gonna be out on the day stage about enterprise gardens. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay. Well, thanks for listening, talk about, listen to us talk about our company, our passion. I hope you took away the lessons of how to create a great startup and how to create great products. Thank you.